Welcome to Tulane University for this evening's event, Community, excuse me, Environmental Justice Visionaries along the Mississippi River. My name is Rebecca Snedeker, and I direct the New Orleans Center for the Gulf South at Tulane, which is housed in our School of Liberal Arts. We support the understanding of this region and its relationship to the global and planetary. And all of our programming is based on the belief that the more we understand where we are, the more fully we can engage in our democracy and collective destiny. I'm really grateful to, uh, to our team who supported this event. Ruby Kim, who's here, who's an environmental studies student, and Regina Karen, our exec executive secretary, and Leah LaRue, our project coordinator. Uh, I also want to give a shout out and thanks to the Mississippi River Open School, our collaborators along the Mississippi River, and our friends and colleagues from Community Members for Environmental Justice and McAllister College who are here from Minnesota. Welcome to all of you. It's so good to have you here. We were fortunate, um, a, a delegation of us from the Gulf South Open School uh, was fortunate last May to go up to Minneapolis and learn from our friends who are here tonight and we were uh, on a toxicity tour, learning about industrial pollution and the work of CMEJ that y'all will hear about tonight. And it's just been um, really profound to see some of the similar like multivalent patterns of extraction that go on all over the world, but particularly along the Mississippi River and see what's similar and what's different. And we just like can be more grateful uh, to have you all here in person in dialogue with incredible leaders from our region. Uh, I'm grateful um, for the support that the City River Open School has had to, to come together and cohere as a group. We are basically launching, to those of you not familiar, we're launching an uh, open school of activities that are free and open to the public, that believe in learning outdoors together from places and from one another and from people with various forms of knowledge um, and expertise and life experience. We were uh, having an amazing afternoon with Shane Griffin and Monique Verdan moving through what is commonly called the French Quarter and the Lafitte Corridor to learn about Black and Indigenous histories in the region and to, um, to look ahead to our futures together. To logistics, uh, thank you all for making it here. <laughs> it's no noticeable fee. Anyone who wants to use the restroom, if you go out the store, to your, go to your left and then take another left and the bathrooms are down this hallway. Um, and also we're gonna have a reception after the event, so please stick around if you'd like to continue the conversation. And now I will introduce our moderator, Michael Asuka. As Asaluka, excuse me. Michael Asaluka is an organizer and filmmaker based in New Orleans who spent the past nine years organizing for labor and climate justice in Southeast Louisiana. In 2021, she helped to co-found Louisiana Justice Recovery Network, which deployed hundreds of volunteers to tarp and gut 200 cancer alley homes in the months following Hurricane Ida's landfall. Since 2022, she's worked as a producer and director of the Frontline Media Network, creating short-form documentaries and video reels that elevate climate justice stories from the Gulf South front lines. Michael is a 2023 Public Voices Fellow with the Yale Program on Climate Communications and a proud member of the Black Alliance for Peace. She currently works with Break Free from Plastic, where she partners with leaders in Appalachia, Appalachia and the Gulf South to resist the expansion of the petrochemical industry. All right, passing it on to Michael. It's always weird to listen to someone else read your bio, and now the two of y'all will have that wonderful <laughs> experience. <laughs> um, and we're gonna have Joe join us in just a moment. You know, I, I had a, some trouble parking around here, and I'm sure you know she will as well. But she'll be, she'll be coming and, and joining us. But first, I want to introduce my my friends, colleagues, Sage Michael Pellet. He's a native of New Orleans East, a founder of Sageville, and a founder of New Orleans for Lincoln Beach. He has deep roots in New Orleans, and as a survivor of Hurricane Katrina, he has seen firsthand how environmental injustice, environmental racism, climate disaster, and generational disinvestment from community infrastructure has allowed for unjust and racist development that prioritizes tourism and transplants over the native New Orleanians, especially the black New Orleanians who make the city what it is. As an established local organizer, Sage Michael builds with those underrepresented and most impacted to strengthen coalitions that ensure community decision-making and just transition. 
His commitment and leadership are shown through many things, but for one example, his advocacy to restore and reopen the historic black landmark of Lincoln Beach. Um, so we're really happy to have him here today. And Roxanne O'Brien is an organizer who's rooted in North Minneapolis and a founder of Communities for Environmental Justice. Um, before we go into our panel, she's gonna speak with us a little bit about the work that they do. But Roxanne has fought against police brutality for equality in education and to address the foreclosure crisis. Most importantly, she's a mother and a neighbor who works to ensure her kids and her community can breathe clean air drink clean water, um, and live a life that's free from lead and toxic emissions. So Roxanne has been a leader in a 10-year fight against Northern Metals Recycling. Um, you know, they've won a lot of victories, um, and they're working towards shutting down the plant for good. As a risk taker, a freedom fighter, and a dedicated community leader, Roxanne is committed to strengthening her people's capacity to fight for the right to thrive. Um, and I'm gonna introduce Jo Banner. She is a famous, many of y'all have heard about her. She's a living legend, but Jo will join us shortly. Um, she's about to go to Canada to negotiate a, with a global plastics treaty at the United Nations. So just to give you a sense of what the scale that she's working on, but she's a generational resident of St. John the Baptist Parish, who was born and raised in the black descendant community of Wallace, Louisiana. And along with her twin sister, Joy, she co-founded the Descendants Project, where she now channels her passion and knowledge into challenging systems of extraction that have long exploited her people, for all the way from the historical plantation economy to the present day petrochemical economy. And as a resident of the River Parish region that we all know as Cancer Alley, Joe champions environmental justice causes and African American cultural preservation. And she develops strategies to transform land that's slated for use by polluting industries into green and verdant spaces where communities like her can thrive. So give our speakers a round of applause. <laughs> and give yourselves a round of applause for being here. I'm gonna keep making y'all clap. <laughs> That's right. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Roxanne, who's gonna um, teach us a little bit about the work that her community and her organization have been up to. So go ahead, Roxanne. You can just turn on one of those mics. Hello? Hello. Can y'all hear me all right? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you for welcoming me and us. My whole team is there. Shout out to my team in the back. Shout out to McAllister for making this happen. Um, because you really can't get anywhere without other people, right? And so I just want to acknowledge that a lot of people supported me and lifted me up in my life. And so that's why I'm able to be here with you all today to at least tell some of the stories of what's happening in our communities. So I would like to say, um, first off, I never imagined getting into work of environmental justice. I think as you grow up as a kid, you think, you know, you're going to grow up and be a singer or a star or something um, exciting. And, and all of this work is, is exciting. It's also it's also hard. Um, I think the best part is getting a chance to meet a bunch of different people and getting a chance to like relate to people and what's going on. So when this all started, um, I was basically doing a lot of like beginning organizing work. I had been a part of a program from Hope Community in Minneapolis, which is a housing of it's, it's, it's a housing now, but it was for people back in the day who just were homeless or were running away from domestic violence. So now um, they teach people how to do community organizing in the community. And I went through a program called SPEAK, Sustainable Progress Through Engaging Active Citizens. And so a lot of where I am today was, again, because people instilled tools into me to be able to fight these injustices. Um, I think I wasn't really aware of my power back in the day. I thought power was like this bad thing that was hierarchy and um, it was more about violence. But then um, I was taught, you know, power is the ability to act and to make an effect. And so when it was explained to me like that, um, and explained to me that power was relational, 
I began to build relationships with people around my community based on issues that impacted them, based on issues that were important to them. So although I started out organizing around park equity, um, as I started to do homework and do one-to-ones, I ended up um, doing foreclosure prevention work and learning about electoral politics, learning about all the neighborhood organizations and how kind of money comes in from federal to state, um, regional, city, then kind of sprinkles down into neighborhoods. So there was a lot of things that I had to learn. Um, shout out to speak, rather than a speak member out in the audience too. But yeah, long story short, I found out that there was a, a, a place called Northern Meadows in my community that um, at the time, again, I was working on foreclosure prevention work. So I knew where the highest foreclosures were. That was in 55411 and 55412. But in particular, the highest foreclosures were in a neighborhood called Hawthorne. Ironically, that is the same neighborhood with the highest rates of lead. And one day I had gotten um, some information that there was a plant called Northern Metals that shredded metal into the air. So they shredded uh, different toxins like mercury, chromium, um, lead, um, just, just a bunch of different particulate matter. There was just a bunch of different toxins coming into the air. And a lot of these toxins cause cancer and respiratory illnesses and asthma. I mean, if you're from, if you know about these things, you know this is happening everywhere all over the nation in poor or indigenous and black or brown neighborhoods, poor white too. Um, so when I learned that, I was so upset because my community had been like creating all these gardens and um, just doing their best, you know, but the narrative was that we were so unhealthy that we were just killing each other. <laughs> Um, and so I just started to ask a lot of questions, um, like, are we really, is there more violence than there is pollution? Like, you know, and I learned that twice as many people were dying from pollution than from homicide. You know, as you started to meet people and pe data experts started to help us out in the community, we started to have questions and, and that's when they came in. You know, it was, it was really good to have other people with different expertise in the neighborhood to be able to simplify the information for people like me so that I could go out and do something about it. And I did what I could, which was you know, join forces with other EJ elders out there who had been fighting. Um, and they really, again, like lifted me up out here. And so um, through a lot of fighting, a lot of rallies, uh, a lot of battles with this place that the community had been fighting against before they even got to our community. But I think they had been there for about maybe 10 years, the company that owned it at the time when I found out. Um, and then 10 years later, we kicked that place out of our community. And it took a lot of organizing, a lot of, um, again, utilizing those relationships that our community um, had met with, so public officials, um, people who worked at the state, the AG's office, um, a lot of the public officials, but a lot of community did the strategy and the organizing. So we came up with all different types of ways to get rid of this entity. And this entity wasn't the only place that was in our community. It was just one of the places. There was a slew of, of, of um, facilities and probably about 14 that were in particular, pretty bad. We also live um, right off of the Mississippi in North Minneapolis, um, and we have no access to the river. So all of that, all of the river in my community is um, overcrowded by the industrial, the industrial facility. So one of the things that our communities did or one of the reasons why community members for environmental justice started was based on a lot of the work that our community was already doing. It's just, we were doing it for free. I was a super volunteer for about eight years. And, um, and I was on Section 8 at the time and you know on disability as well. So I could have just stayed at the house 
you know, but I was pretty angry about it and I got up and did um, a lot of um, meetings and, and, you know, yelling at public officials and calling things out for what they were, racism. You know, I, I think that in our community, like you really have to call it out for what it is to get people to actually do something about it. So that's what I did and a lot of people listened and a lot of my community kind of followed and got involved. Um, and so again, I think in 20, 2016, there was a consent decree that actually closed Northern Meadows. So like they can no longer shred in our community anymore. However, when they were supposed to leave, they didn't want to leave. So we had to enter into litigation. There was whistleblowers coming out. There was corruption. It was, um, it was pretty lively for a while, but like it would just make you very angry. Um, and so for a minute, all they could do was accept metal. <laughs> and, and even that was dangerous because those stacks of metal and fluff would catch on fire every now and then. Um, and so that's, that was the final push that I think our communities got together was like, you know what, y'all just gotta go in general. You just have to leave. Um, and so they were forced out. They moved to a city called Becker. Three months later, they burned for five days. They burned for five days and they used 500 million gallons of water to put that fire out. So community members for environmental justice is just like the vehicle. Um, it stands for what we mean. We're just, we're for justice. We're for environmental justice and we're for justice for people. And so sometimes people think police brutality has nothing to do with environmental justice, but it has a lot to do with it because police are the people who keep the haves and the have nots, you know, apart. And they're, they're also the people who um, help other corporations to exploit and destroy our natural resources. And as my indigenous pe people and friends would say, you know, they're not just our resources, but they are um, living beings and, and, and um, relatives. So it's not just about us as humans, <laughs> what we need. Um, and so I think a lot of our work is also about being stewards of the land. And so we feel that it needs to be protected. We, we no longer want it to be exploited. So some of the work that we have been doing um, is working on changing the zoning laws, the 100-year-old zoning laws that kind of put the concentration of these facilities in our community. So we've been working on that. We've been we're pretty successful. Uh, we realized one of the ways in which to change laws is um, to, to definitely build relationships with staff at the city. A lot of the staff have a lot of control over whether or not public officials decide to do something. So we made best friends with a lot of the city staff. We weren't always best friends, <laughs> but we have become really good, um, good in with the government. Matter of fact, I'm supposed to get an award tomorrow, but I won't be there because I'm here with you good people. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this was a, the last rally that we did um, before the Metabellas was pushed out. And currently, I think something's exciting for you to know is we have this opportunity to purchase this land now. And so it's really great to like see, you know, the fighting wasn't in vain. Like we, you know, a lot of times they're just like, y'all just don't want nothing. You know, you don't want development. You know, and we're like, we want development. We want community-centered development. We want development that's actually relevant to our needs. And so we are, I found out I'm kind of a developer now. I got my friend in the back who's a, a real estate agent and she's like, girl, you're a pre-developer. I'm like, okay. Cause I used to think just like power developers were bad too. I'm like, you know, cause that's the only, the only time where you see power on TV or you see or you hear about developments, it doesn't seem to take into account any of my people. So I guess for a minute, I just didn't know that the pre-organizing that we're doing, talking with community about what they want, all that is a part of, of being a developer, but um, an equitable one. 
don't know how much time I have left, but some of these facilities, uh, like this one, for example, GAF Moving Shingle Corporation, that we take people to on our tours, our EJ tours that we do. This place bought this land for a dollar, and it's right over the bridge from Northern Meadows, or from what used to be known as Northern Meadows. And they not only bought this place for a dollar, but this is a roof shingle company that they're a nationwide company, they're a billion dollar corporation, and they make 25% of their nationwide profits off of our community. 25% of their nationwide profits off of our community alone. And I live in a black community. There's a couple of communities, well, we're growing, but there's a few, there's like three good communities filled with either like black folks or immigrants, African, Africans, and it's like North, North Side is also a Jewish, old Jewish neighborhood, so like pretty much where all the undesirables of the government went. And um, yeah, we, we, have, we have a lot of issues with our public officials doing things without us, and I, I know you've heard the saying, you know, nothing uh, without us is for us, or something like that, and so they do a lot of work without us, and they kind of bring us to the table after the menu has been set, and they're like, hey, what kind of park structures do you want in this park? And then they're building right here is Upper Harbor Terminal, the last undeveloped piece on the Mississippi River, which CMEJ also had entered into litigation against the city for because they didn't do an environmental review. They claimed that they did, but they didn't. And they want to build a 10,000 seat concert venue. The owners of First Ave, so I don't know if you know like the history of like Prince uh, in our community, but he used to perform at First Avenue a lot. So the owner there um, is now working with the second richest white family in the state called the Polad family to develop this uh, area. And so we had other ideas. <laughs> that what we could do, but um, we're watching it. I actually don't think it will succeed, even though they've gotten through all the, you know, the cuts and corners. I just, sometimes I think when things aren't really right, they just will fall apart. So I'm hoping that's what will happen. Um, but yeah, they want to build housing, not for us necessarily. And all this is within a green zone. So if you've heard of green zones, green zones are areas that are supposed to be targeted with resources and green jobs and low-income housing, and yet you still have government not following it because it's, it might still be, it's a, it's a resolution, it's not an ordinance, so they don't have to be held accountable. But what you just saw on the last slide, uh, shout out to Howa in the back who does graphics and she does a visual note-taking, so that's what that is. Um, so she listened to people in the room. Um, Justice was also there, um, Danielle. And we all kind of talked with community about like what really, what were some things that we kind of wanted to see. And so these are some of the ideas that took place. Yeah, this is a garbage truck burner in our community. Um, just a lot of facilities, but we, like I said, we've been doing some work. We just uh, passed a cumulative impact bill at the state level last year in May. Um, so we're the third state in the nation to do that. I think we're following behind New Jersey and New York. And really that just puts a cap on pollution. It doesn't even decrease it. it we wouldn't believe how controversy our bill was um, to people. Um, but yeah, we're just decrease, we're just stopping the cap of people coming into our community. And that's also what the zoning law changes are at the city level that we did. So we're changing things at the state level, at the city level, and then this year we've come out with another bill, um, amortization. So we kept asking questions like, why are these facilities continuing to be in our communities? And we were told these places were grandfathered in. And when we didn't understand what that meant, you know, we did some research, talked to people, got some lawyers, and found out that amortization was something where you, cities, it would give cities the tool to phase out facilities or phase out places that no longer meet, you know, the standards of the community um, morally. So right now, currently, you can only ban a sexual bookstore. <laughs> but you can't like ban a facility that's giving people cancer and asthma. 
you know, sexual bookstores, that's wrong. <laughs> we can kill people all day, but sexual bookstores, that's where they draw the line. So we're working on, uh, we're working on changing that and adding um, industry production and, pro production and processing um, and industrial uses to the language. That's all we're adding. Um, so we're basically amending the law. Uh, it was banned about maybe 20 years ago. Um, so yeah, we've been doing a lot of lobbying um, out here. So shout outs to my team who are, we're all going crazy trying to purchase land, do a lobbying, do the city laws, do the state laws, <laughs> flying all over. And like, it's getting, it's amazing to see that people are seeing our work and we look forward. I think one of the most important things, and I believe it, is that we have a garden, y'all. Um, one of the most important things is um, that I really saw this grant program as an opportunity for us to join forces with people along the Mississippi River. So I forever have been excited about coming to New Orleans because I'm like, you know, I've always been like a, a a local fighter, and a lot of people have pushed me to do national things, but I've always wanted to be local. But then, because um, y'all know that Outcast song, if you want to change the nation, start from their corner, they inspired me all. And so that's why I stayed at that level for so long. But now I'm like, why not take it up a level? Like, I, I, I would like to show communities what we did and how we did it and see if we can kind of just like spread that energy throughout the nation. Um, and also, I'm, I want to know how you guys are doing what you're doing, because what you guys are doing are amazing, and, and we're inspired. So I'll stop there, because I don't know how long I've been talking. It's all good, you know. We, we love to hear from you. You know, a lot of us aren't familiar with the work that's happening at the headwaters of the Mississippi, but now let's move over to the bottom of the Mississippi. Um, and you know, Sage, just I had some questions prepared, but there were so many things that Roxanne said that I just know from your work just directly resonate with you, whether it's unjust development, you know, uh, black communities being targeted for certain things, not having access to the water. Um, and so I guess I'd, I'd just love for you to share um, just anything that that brought up for you, and maybe just as a way of starting you off, um, if you can uh, you know, maybe talk a little bit about the complex relationship that your community has with, with water. Yeah, sure. Um, we live surrounded by water, but in fear of water. Um, we cross so many bridges, Tell if you would take every bridge away, we wouldn't know how to get around. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we were introduced to water through trauma. Like, you know, um, when black people wanted to uh, fight for freedom in America and fighting wars and dying, we wanted to come back to America and draw the waters. But unfortunately, during Jim Crow South, talking about the Mississippi River, uh, I also, also say the American dream never made it down to New Orleans. It got stopped in the flow by Jim Crow. And with that being said, when the Union soldiers went back up north, uh, you know, these governments started segregating the water. And that's tragic. Uh, talk about the river and the port. New Orleans was founded because of that port. Because these colonists saw a way that the indigenous people showed them a road to get from the Mississippi River down this Bayou Road, and you could get to Bayou St. John, which was originally Bayou Shoepick, and you get to Lake Pontchartrain, and you get to extract all this wealth out of Louisiana. That's why it's called Sportsman Paradise. Not because of the sinks, <laughs> but because of the wildlife, the game, the ecosystem that they extracted, all the lumber that was extracted. And to bring it home here to uh, Tulane University and in other connections with the water, there was a man named Sam Zamuri. He was uh, president of United Fruit Company, which is now Shaquille International. Sam Zamuri um, had a track, the company had a track of land way in New Orleans East, 2.5 acres. Black people, the government on these leverages in New Orleans was dredging the lake and building land and building the levees along, and black people wanted to live there, and they said, no, we're gonna re realign this area. Black people will lower the property value so black people can go there. Black people want to swim on those waters. 
They use that police force. So police brutality is a part of environmental injustice. If you look at a map right now on Google, you'll see a street called Elysian Fields. It goes from the river all the way to Lakeshore Drive. When you get to Lakeshore Drive, you will see a police station. That's the controller. In front of that is a place which they created for themselves called Pontchartrain Beach. And black people could not go there. And they used that police force and all those laws to push people all the way up to the, all the way up to about seven miles up to the wildlands, to this area that Sam Murray said, no, y'all can't come here, but you could go there. And they called it Lincoln Beach. Sam Murray donated to Audubon Place to Tulane University. It's a mansion here that they donated that the president stay in. He was an extractionist. Sam Murray, through a military coup, left the port of New Orleans in a United States vessel, went to Honduras and threw a military coup over Honduras. And that's why we have a lot of Honduran connection here. And that's why we sing Shakira Banana, my mama Banana. But it's extractionism. This building right here is surreal for me, the Stone Auditorium, right? I believe it's named after Doris Zamuri Stone, the daughter of Sam Zamuri. So the daughter was married to a stone and she gave money back to Tulane to help the people as the fall extracted. So I'm thankful that the next generation saw that, take that wealth and make something out of it. So in 1965, when civil rights came, they closed Lincoln Beach. That's the environment and justice right there. I call those people criminals. On that side of the levee, it's separated by a levee, I call that heaven on earth. On the other side of the levee that we live in, I call that mankind, a kind of man that we cannot survive on. Now, why is it that you have 17 acres of property that's the natural healing place that no one could go to, but over here, they close all the pools, they close all the water, and they pollute us? Extractionism is about pollution. Um, in New Orleans, you know, we have our friends who have fought in Garden Plaza, residents who have had residents on toxic landfill, but the government would shut down the school, they would shut down the housing complex, but they would not fully relocate these communities. And these communities were dying from cancer, dying from, I mean, fetal births, um, people living with cancer. I often say environmental justice is invisible in New Orleans but it's not tracked. Um, those people had to fight for that. If you come to New Orleans, the majority of New Orleans people have some type of respiratory illness. They have some type of skin illness. We have our water from the Mississippi River. That is the bottom of y'all um, tub. When you drain your tub up the dirt tub, that's what we get. We boil that water, put some stuff in it, and we drink from it. But that water comes through lead water lines. So um, they stopped testing lead at about two years old, something like that, say you're good now. But all that hammering, jacking up the streets and everything like that, well, guess what that's doing? That lead is going through those water lines. But you've got billions of dollars to replace the lead water lines, but nothing to the health of those people. Something's wrong with that picture. I'll be uh, transparent. Uh, I have a skin disorder with Tulane. Uh, doctors told me. <laughs> Pru ego nodularis. That's um, extreme inflation in your body, inf in in inflammation in your body. See, what happens is with pollution, internal and external, if you're not getting the proper water in your body, polluted water, your body gonna fight it out and try to get all that out. The pollution that's, on, that's in our air, it lands in our skin. If you can't see your pores, your skin can't breathe, it's a problem. So majority, a lot of people I see now, I got an extreme condition, but a lot of people have this condition. But it's not diagnosed where it's, they're gonna solve it, they're just gonna treat the condition. So I'm getting a little old, I got uh, medicine that's on commercial, like the picture <laughs> now, you know. But I'm thankful for it because it's a process where I still gotta stand for community. Because the work I do is 10 toes down. I have a peaceful resistance at Lincoln Beach. It is illegal to be there. It's trespassed. I've been over there for four years doing this in front of the community. I'm doing good trouble over there. See, there's a place that, there's a, there, there's a reason why I, I, I went through police brutality in my past days on Canal Street. 
I got railroaded. And when you file complaints against police, they retaliate against you. And they don't think you are smart enough to go and get public request records and go get body cam footage and take your time and bring them coffees and say, let's talk this out. Um, and have officers to really guide you along the way. And people really say, you're a great person. They're wrong for that. We got to have people in these offices, in these fields, that point out the bad. Pollution is bad, and it kills our most impacted people. New Orleans right now has most people, black and indigenous people, living on the lowest lands in New Orleans. That is not by accident. When Katrina hit, who you saw on the rooftops? Katrina Orway, who you see living in New Orleans? Those same people on the rooftops did not make it back to New Orleans. And people like me standing 10 toes down, I'm fighting. I'm connecting with the new resources coming in. I'm holding leaders accountable to the funding that's coming in. I'm watching every step of the way. It is not easy. I get you. Y'all, I know that Joe's coming because I've been texting with her, but we've got an excellent panel with these two speakers right here. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you both. I want to I wanna talk, like we have a few minutes left before we open up to audience Q&A, and I really want to ask y'all, because you both laid out a very strong analysis of you know the history, what led us to the situation, what you've been doing to fight against polluting industries and against unjust development. But both of y'all are also deeply engaged in fighting for what you want to see in your communities, what you deserve to have in your communities. Um, and so Roxanne, I'd love to have you talk a little bit more about you know, what is the positive vision for environmental justice, uh, for just economic development, and what are the most effective strategies that you're using? And Sage, I would ask you the same question, but we'll start with Roxanne. <laughs> <laughs> so, is that me? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> so, I think um, I'm like I should really love this question because it's a great question. I also there was something you said. I don't want to go back to it. Y'all go go ahead. Okay, well this I'm gonna answer. Like. I'm gonna answer that because that's a great question. I love. Also, it's good to dream, too, because we fight a lot, so it's not healthy. <laughs> um, but I will just say, when you talked about, like, skin disease and inflammation, like, I'm struggling with inflammation so bad right now. And I was just like, wow. You know, I think that's why it's important for our communities to talk to each other. I think one of the most dangerous things to the establishment is us talking to each other and us telling each other what's happening in our community so that we can get to the bottom. There's a story about like babies in the river or babies in the water and like as organizers, most people, most of those places are trying to plug babies out of the water as they're coming down the water. Like that's a problem. When you're seeing babies floating down the water, your first instinct is to go just grab them. But as an organizer, like, I'm trying to figure out who's throwing the babies in the water, you know? And I think we know, right? But I think there was a lot of things that I had to learn. Like, the government is just not this one person that is broken up into sections. And I think that's also a way to confuse us, you know? It just kind of, like, sends you everywhere because it's like, oh, we don't deal with that. They deal with that. And they do that. And, like, you know, just it just is part of the system. And... Um, but thank you for mentioning that, because now I want to know what the name it is that we're talking about. Um, and I also want to talk to my community about it and see like what, who else is experiencing these skin conditions and this inflammation, because I hear a lot of people talk about inflammation. I'm hearing a lot of people you know, dying from cancer right now. It's super scary. <laughs> it's like, how is everybody, how is this happening right now with everybody? That's scary. But I think after all this fighting, um, I never would have thought, you know, there was always something in me that was like, you know, keep going, right? Because there was many days I just wanted to give up. Um, I just wanted to give up because it's so hard. And I did, I had police at my windows often. Being an activist, it's not, it's not, um, it, you know, it's like the Olympics nowadays. Everybody wants to make a rally and make a march, but like, 
it's all fun and games to the police to follow you <laughs> and like they're coming to your windows and tapping on your, your doors and um, at one o'clock in the morning on a Sunday uh, being weird. Um, but yeah, we have this amazing idea to get this piece of land that was so toxic. Um, we're working on applying for the EPA grant out there right now, the change grant. Um, yeah, and, and hopefully your communities will tap into that as well. Um, but with millions of dollars, we could purchase this land for $3.5 million. Uh, that is the offer. We wanted to buy the whole land, so we had offered $12 million. Of course, with no money, just all heart. Like, we're going to get it, though. <laughs> We gonna give you 20, 12 million. <laughs> I've never even seen 12 million. <laughs> but but believing that, right? It's crazy. Like we gonna come up with 12 million. I mean, believing that we were gonna shut down Northern Metals was a dream. We started out just like, you know, them trying to pollute, uh, increase the pollution by a thousand percent, and we stopped that, you know. And then we stopped them from operating, and then we stopped them from being able to accept the. The, the metal shredding. So it was like phases and battles, right? But now they're gone. And now we get this opportunity to buy this land. And now we get an opportunity to do development better than our government has ever done, right? And we get a chance to show them how it's done or how we, you know, we get a chance to set the bar. <laughs> um, so we have ideas. We have, we wanted an indoor playground, but you know, there's work to do around like the toxins. So we have to figure out like, is that possible? Can we even, is it gonna be safe with how much it's been exploited for years? It's always been a steel metal, metal shredding place for about 40 years and lead doesn't go anywhere, which I'm wondering how do you give permission to do that <laughs> to a company if you know that will forever be there? So we are gonna try to get this money so we can clean up the building and, uh, and move forward and clean up the soil. But since we only have a parcel that we'll be able to work with, we haven't even gotten it yet. I'm just claiming it, y'all. That we gonna get this land. We gonna invite y'all to it and we gonna work together. And at least we're gonna protect that one part, you know? We're gonna do our best to protect that part as we know that you know what happens on our part of the river affects y'all. And so we're working hard to, um, we would love to have a relationship, build that relationship, see how powerful that can get, you know, come back and forth, see what we can do. Maybe we can fight our governments together, you know? Because we know a lot of public officials on our side, so um, maybe we can figure it out. But we, we plan to build um, a center where we can start our EJ tours at. So we plan to buy an electric bus. There's enough space to park it in the garage. Um, we talked about having office space for families, you know, women who could take their kids to work, but we'd have like a center part where kids can play um, and be safe and protected. Uh, we talked about maybe turning it into some sort of like museum that would honor like, you know, the history of the land and the environmental justice movement, indigenous folks. Um, we talked about doing land back. So we've been talking to indigenous people about like, you know, do you guys want some, some of this land? Um, we're also hearing from them that they don't want, you know, toxic land in the urban city because that's not where like their people are, or at least the ones we talk to. I don't want to assume for everyone that that's not the case. But, um, you know, as we're trying to figure all this out, we've got all these ideas for land back and we've got all these big ideas, and so we, um, we're, we're shooting for the moon, or what is that, we're shooting for the stars, so we might land on the moon. So, I know we have our other panelists here, so. <laughs> yes, welcome, Joe. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we're really excited to have you here, and listen, like, you're right on time. We're excited <laughs> to have you. We've had a good discussion so far. Um, you know, both, both Roxanne and Sage laid out a historical analysis of how their communities came to be dealing with environmental injustice and pollution, and now we're talking about um, the positive vision, what they're trying to fight for, and what kind of strategies they're using. But Sage, if it's okay, before I turn it to you, maybe just to give Joe a little bit of space to talk about um, the history of, of, of Wallace and the work that the Descendants Project is, is doing. Please do. Apologies, y'all. I've been walking around this campus. Oh, wait. 
Here you go. It's okay. I don't know it's if she's playing cameras either. But it takes a second. It'll okay. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah. I've been walking around for 40 minutes going from one building to the other. So clearly my ancestors were not the ones who moved <laughs> direction. Um, but anyway, I'm happy to be here. My name is Joe Manor. I have a nonprofit called The Descendants Project. We're located in St. John the Baptist Parish, which is one of the oldest parishes that we have in Louisiana. It was started a little bit, uh, I think a year after New Orleans uh, became a colony. Uh, so St. John was started in um, an effort to actually provide food for the colony in, in New Orleans. So the farmland that was there, or the land was deemed farmland, it was taken, of course, from the indigenous, and they looked for the indigenous tribes um, and saw where they were at, and that's why they knew to go into St. John and St. Charles. So they used that indigenous knowledge and they exploited it, uh, brought Germans to the area, used that land to grow farms, and that food was supposed to feed the colony in Louisiana, in New Orleans, excuse me. That happened for about a year or so, um, the Germans were then given enslaved Africans to work the land with them. So my family descends from the enslaved Africans and from the Europeans and the Germans that came through the area. Probably the indigenous would haven't been able to find any blood. So um, yeah, just having that, that colony there and my community is based off of those first people for the most part who came to that area. Uh, we were made to make to make life easier for New Orleans. And so I kind of feel like my community in one sense has always been this um, sacrifice zone. We're gonna make money, we're gonna use the Africans there to work the land and we're gonna extract it and, and send it to somebody else. So I feel that that same spirit there sometimes, although I love my, my community in St. John, I think we're rural, uh, I mean, we are rural, but I love being in the, the ruralness, I love the different cultures, but at the same time, what we're seeing is a continuation of that plantation system that arose from these sustenance farms that then got converted into sugar plantations, which is refining, it's refining of a chemical, and that's exactly where we are today, the refinement of chemicals, um, we're in the middle of Cancer Rally. Uh, St. John has the highest risk of cancer in, in the country. Maybe you've addressed this before, but just dealing with such a beautiful culture on one side of it, but at the same time also dealing with the ramifications of descending um, from, like, from these plantations of what it's doing for us now. The beauty of our area is to that um, from, the hard, from the hard battles we've had to fight, we have a community of soldiers and we are descendants of black Union soldiers. The Union soldiers and their families founded part of my community, and I have the privilege of growing up, not just near a plantation, but also in a free town, a freedom village, um, founded by those Union soldiers. So I am really touching my, as much with, 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 as I can with that spirit and fighting hard and knowing that I'm in a perfect place to fight back. So. Thank you so much for that. Um, so Sage, I'll turn it over to you. And just to, to reiterate, um, you know, we're talking a lot about the, the historical analysis, the current injustices, the intersecting injustices, but what is the, your community's positive vision and, and how, what are the strategies you're using to achieve that? Thanks. Um, I'm also off Joe. Hey, Joe. <laughs> we're, um, we're fighting systems yeah. and we're the people within those systems. Um, we, we are people in New Orleans, but we don't, we're not the system of New Orleans. The system of New Orleans extracts so much, but the people in New Orleans hurts up and down the river, um, and we suffer so much as well. And I, I just wonder why we had it, you let me know that that was set up for New Orleans. Um, we gotta make sure we don't have this, this setup of historical discontent, because like sometimes in New Orleans, um, we look at it like all resources go to New Orleans, but it's not going to St. James. It's not going to Plaquemines. It's not going to those river parishes and New Orleans getting it all. But I was like, hold tight. New Orleans is a nonprofit extraction zone. Yeah. All these nonprofits based in New Orleans don't fight for New Orleans. They're not in city hall, city hall council meetings. Like these nonprofits living in New Orleans and, and not paying taxes, they're not paying into our management, our stormwater system. Our drainage system, for the most part, is paid by 
our tax of tax millage. And for those entities that are tax exempt are not paying into helping us drain our city. But majority of institutions that are tax exempt are putting the largest burden on our water systems. But what is being done? We have a state governor right now, more like a sheriff, just want to come, I'm going, I'm going to come take over your sewage and water board of New Orleans, of New Orleans. But the sewage and water board is a state entity already. It just has the mayor as, as the head of the board. So what is it that's going to happen, what they're going to do? They're going to raise our water bill. Well, we know that trick not going to work. We're going to raise the water bill. You don't have a great bill dispute system for me to go down and get the bill. I mean, our sewage and water board, it's like I'm going to walk in the central lockup more than I'm going to pay a water bill. It's not friendly. It's on St. Joe's. you got to pay for parking. These are the systems that stop people from going to advocate for their community. For me to fight for my community at City Hall, i got to go pay for parking. i got to wait until I get to my agenda item, which they might defer and reschedule while I sit there. And give me two minutes to talk, knowing I got more than two minutes, and, uh, and don't have no comment on what I just said. These are the things that we fight. Yeah. But what we for is, when we look at the management water system, it's to drain the sponge. So we have a canal system in New Orleans East that's open canals right now. And we in New Orleans, they got this place called Bayou St. John. And those people down there really enjoy that canal, and they're part of the foreign population. Prior to that, it was called Bayou Shoe Pick. But as you mentioned, those indigenous people were pushed out, and those other people were placed there, and it's a large land. So we took our large black and Vietnamese community members of New Orleans East, because our black and Vietnamese community members don't really connect how we're supposed to interchange culture like we should. So we took them all the way down to Bayou St. John, Waters Bayou. Let's see how, how they living. Let's imagine the canals in New Orleans East and see how we could transform those canals. Because you're right, there's a lot of plans out there. You know, a lot of people from New Orleans after the flood in New Orleans went to the Dutch, had Dutch dialogues, and they, cre and they had a, created a plan called the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Plan. It's been sitting on somebody's desk for 10 years. And when I was hired on an organization called Held the Gulf, and I looked at a concept called Transforming Canals, I said, this is beautiful. My community deserves this, and we're gonna make it happen. I love this concept, let's ball it up and throw it away. Why? Because I believe, and we believe, I'm working with partners like Civic Studios, Wall East Institute, Song CDC is a Vietnamese advocate for Vietnamese community members, Bachelor LLC comes with the engineering and bio education on it, and I work with Healthy Gulf, connecting our communities with our, my organizing skills, and being a born and raised, raised in New Orleans person, to make sure we build that community-based knowledge, build that experience for them to imagine their waterways, and let them design the canals, let them come up with designs, and we take that, then we're gonna follow that design for them. We're working on a project right now in um, Michoud right now at the Maxon Canal. I'm so excited to see a community-driven design. I don't see that any other place. I'm fighting with city planning commissions and these economic development people that just, hey, this is what you all want. Did you talk to us? Well, we rode with you all. No, you did not ride with us. Did you ride with them? No, we did not actually ride with them. I mean, these people lie in city office and don't get fired. <laughs> and get promoted. And they said, they are smart people. Well, wait, my project's delayed. You, you deappropriated money from Lincoln Beach to play Garden Plaza. How do you do that? That's the environment and justice that we face in New Orleans. You have a black community fighting tooth and nail, managing city property that's been closed for 1965 for four years, during COVID, during Black Lives Matter, because you ride around New Orleans, you don't see nothing that says Black Lives Matter like written out on the street like you see across the world. But we live in a, a majority black city, indigenous people, but you don't see that we are connected to it. So let's take the step back. Let's bring those people to the table. You are the subject matter experts because you have the lived experience. And we're going to expand your knowledge on green infrastructure, on, on, on connecting with those leaders, on getting those federal dollars coming down the pipeline, because they say they got to have equity in it. But you are the equity. We are the equity. What does equity look like? It looks like us. OK, I want, I want y'all to give these speakers a round of applause, because they're laying down some powerful stuff. Um, 
I have one last question for y'all before we turn it over um, to have a, one or two questions for our, our, um, for our speakers. Y'all have all talked a lot about lands and, and zoning and the importance of taking back land that's been, that's been stolen, that's been polluted, um, that's been used for extraction instead of empowerment. And so, um, Joe, I want to start with you. You know, the Descendants Project works a lot on land. So can you just talk a little bit about the importance of land and zoning? Um, and then I want to turn it to Sage to talk about Lincoln Beach, and then we'll close sure. it out with Roxanne. Ooh, zoning. Um, zoning has been, since I was 10 years old, uh, the, the property around my, in my community was zoned heavy industry to facilitate Famosa Plastics. Um, which is now attempting to locate in St. James Parish. But thankfully, the community fought and was able to stop this from happening. Um, 30 years ago, in addition to the parish president, was found guilty for being, uh, for illegally being involved in the zoning change. So he went to jail, but most didn't come. Um, we thought we were, in the, we were in the woods. Well, we're out of the woods. We were actually in the woods because the zoning of the land, although the parish president, was found guilty for his involvement, but most didn't come, but the land stayed zone heavy industry, which left it open to just anybody who wanted to come and put um, heavy industrial projects. So um, about three years ago, um, a company by the name of Greenville, Louisiana, attempted to put a grain elevator, uh, which is a massive facility, costs a lot of pollution, 100 tons of particulate matter every year, and that's just the particulate matter, it's more pollution that comes from that. So we've been fighting to stop that, um, that project. We were able to switch the zoning or have the zoning reverted back to residential through a lawsuit. So we had a big win. Um, and then our parish council went back and immediately reverted that zoning back to heavy industry. So now our lawsuit continues because we have to continue to fight the zoning of our, of our parish. And as Sage was saying, it's the system. It, we started our organization to fight the system. The system doesn't change. So no matter what we're doing, if we don't fight, attack that system, it's going to continue, continue in that vein. What uh, we utilized, though, was the protection of a land, was to recognize the history and the culture, particularly the history of enslaved Africans. Our community has plantation homes. We have Whitby, which is a slavery museum. We also have Evergreen Plantation, which is a national historic landmark. So we have these two historical properties, and our community is on the other side. We're descendants of those two plantations, at least you know, those two we have more that we descend from. But what the plans for this grain terminal, we found that we're trying to push the complex over into our community. So we're like, wait a second, no, we're also historical. We're the, we are the descendants. You see those plantations there? Who do you think built them? So we need to be honored and we need to be recognized. Uh, and that fight, it, it was a hard fight. The system was literally not built to recognize the type of history that we had. We were in meetings with the Army Corps of Engineers and they're like, well, I don't know that you're wrong, it's just that we have no way of measuring this because in our rules, it doesn't account for this. Um, so it was really pushing back. But finally, well, two weeks ago, the Army Corps wrote a letter and said that they were gonna recognize our community um, as a National Register Historic District. And they mentioned, the, because of the enslaved Africans, they were acknowledging the black descendant community. Uh, so that is just the protection of land and utilizing your history, knowing your history, providing access to history is another way to stop and to break these systems. It's intentional that the knowledge is kept away from them. That is part, that's the first part of that system, is to strip away any history, any knowledge, any culture that you have of the area so that something else can be implanted in this place. Okay, thank you. Um, let's keep it on a zoning. <laughs> right, because Lincoln Beach has gone through some zoning things right now. First of all, uh, it, um, it is the area which is, um, was Hayne Boulevard. It's a seven mile stretch that goes from New Orleans Lakefront Airport to Paris uh, Road. That is uh, recognized as a cultural products district. A cultural products district means all this art and cultural products you produce, no state sales tax on those products. Also, if you have a historical landmark or cultural um, um, asset, you have 25% reduction on your, on your state taxes. Um, speaking of national historic landmarks, a graduate of Tulane University 
volunteered uh, by the name of Mia Kaplan, volunteered to um, register, uh, to fill out the application for Lincoln Beach to be recognized as a National Historic Landmark. Uh, we visited Baton Rouge for the first committee hearing. It passed unanimously. The community showed up in numbers. Um, that is now sitting with the National um, uh, Parks uh, Service, which is understaffed, <laughs> which we talked to the head of the department. She said, I will get to you as soon as I can, and we believe her. <laughs> but you're talking about um, uh, uh, land use. I'm trying to figure out what the FLUM is going on out here. FLUM stands for Future Land Use Map. Uh, you heard about with the FLUM going on? Uh, yeah, so the FLUM going on. So what you have is, so what the, what's going on when you have amendments to the, uh, to the plan for the city, plan for the city, uh, master plan for the city, um, Lincoln Beach right now is zoned. You can only do some green space stuff, which is we're, we're fine with. Um, but there are efforts recommended from economic development, project manager, to change the zone into a mixed use medium density. Now then you could do, you don't, you don't, it's not guaranteed you could do all this kind of stuff, but you can still keep it here, but we have to make sure that you can't do that, but you can do that. So we say no. We say leave it as is. We say the site's been sitting since 1965. We, the community, put value in it. We put sacrifice in our money, our time, our safety, literally, uh, our political, whatever you want to say, shots we take on a regular basis by holding people accountable. We put our lives on the line, and we also had support from organizations that was part of Collective to make sure we could continue to work, and individual community members. But this future land use map of changing this mixed use medium, this is code word for, we're gonna put what we want in your community whether you like it or not. Listen, uh, we got this, the development dangling cat of affordable housing. We can make big money off affordable housing, and we're gonna affordable housing because you know people need homes. Affordable homes, meaning the people that you see can't afford a home, gonna be able to afford that home, that's not what it's gonna turn out to be. They wanna bring in new people to New Orleans East. And the people in New Orleans East saying, well, you're not caring for the people already here. The population of New Orleans has dropped. Half of my family did not come back to Katrina, it has dropped even more. So what, so what are you building these for? A new New Orleans people, and we say take care of the people there, open up the gate, we need our elders to walk through because they deserve it. We need our children to walk through because they don't have a flower on their street. Literally, not a flower on the street that made me cry. Um, I just feel honored to be here with y'all because there's a lot of wisdom in this room, a lot of power and man, I'm, um, I really hope we can stay connected because I feel like we could write a book between the three of us for <laughs> sure on like a manual on how our governments are doing us. Because I was, as I was listening, I'm like, oh my God, they're doing the same exact thing. And I, we, you know, we talk about it a lot, like, wow, why is it so hard to get downtown? to City Hall, like I hate it. And I always take a lift, so I'm spending extra money and I'm like, this is wild, how is this? I'm supposed to make it to court on time. <laughs> I'm supposed to, not that I'm going to court anymore, y'all, but. <laughs> <laughs> but you might, you know what I'm saying? I'm saying, I've been through it. And, uh, and I think, you know, they put the welfare office down there, some, they used to, but I'm just thinking like all the things, they just make it so hard just to participate. Oh, I was at the state capitol, and I was thinking, I, I just found I had arthritis inflammation uh, like a month ago. And so I was like, you know, hobbling and running from my car, <laughs> trying to get on time to do this hearing about the sportsization bill. I'm running with my youngest daughter, and she's laughing at me, and we're running and laughing. Um, and then I'm thinking, wow, I asked, a bunch of white people on the way running, like, well, where do the handicapped people park at? <laughs> and they were like, oh, they park way over there. And I was like, well, how do they get from oh, way over there to the Capitol? And they were like, we don't know. And I said, wow, that's about six people. How do you know, people who are 
disabled get into the building and nobody knew. I said, wow. So we've created just no way for people to come up here and actually participate. Um, and I'm just thinking about that. I'm thinking about, is there a way we can write a book or is there a way that we can get together and bring up, you know, I'm always down for a litigation against the entire United States if we have to. Mm. Uh, and I think actually that's what we actually need to do. I'm not gonna lie, I feel like we need some sort of mass uh, movement of, of legal action against the United States government for how they are allowing our cities to do the same things. And if we could all get together mm. and tell the same stories, I mean, what other witnesses do you need? So I'm all down for action, y'all. I will just say the zoning process was a bit hard. I heard you talk about economic uh, development, some sort of department. I'm thinking, oh, we, we got a CPEG in our area, which is city planning and economic development, which is one of the things I think we're realizing is they have the most power. <laughs> so strange. That out of all these public officials, it is in fact the staff who have the most power. And you know, public officials aren't reading anything these days. <laughs> they're not reading these big stacks of paper and they get on their desk and they have to read so much that you, we know they're not reading it, right? So they're just listening to whatever the staff members tell them. But then you got people who have been in the government for like 20 and 30 and 40 years. They're quiet on the meetings. They don't say much of anything. They just sit there and watch and listen. Um, same thing with like the lawyer of the park board in our community. We're known as having like the number one park board, I don't know, um, organization in the United States. Um, they own the most land in Minneapolis. And we, are, I'm at my other job, <laughs> I'm uncovering that they're using the emerald ash tree infestation to basically take black people's homes. So it's another issue that we've had to blow up where we're seeing that they're coming on people's private property and they're telling people, yeah, you need to remove this tree, it's infested. They do no proof, no receipt, don't know who's coming and inspecting. Uh, and they're saying, they're saying they, they made a resolution intentionally with the city to make sure that people don't use pesticides or injecticides, right? Which is an inexpensive way of, and it's actually best practice throughout the nation. But the park board is, um, was telling people, not telling people about it, and instead charging people anywhere from $2,000 to $13,000 to cut down the tree. And then forcefully, they've criminalized it in state law by putting it under the nuisance law. So what we're doing is we're going to reverse with everything that they did, right? So I've also been advocating uh, for that work. So my other job, I do work against that issue. But they are, I mean, they are like the masters of destruction and um, I don't know, misconceptions. Someone one day who worked on, um, I know we're supposed to be talking about zoning, but someone one day said, if you want to know how much corruption is in your community, pay attention to how much pollution there is. Mm -hmm. So that there's a correlation with that. And we discovered a lot of corruption. I'd be interested in knowing the story and the name of the guy who got caught with the zoning, because I think that's an important story to tell nationwide. And then we also now need to investigate how much is that happening. And we really need to investigate the people who have the power over these zoning laws. We need to investigate who they're connected to. I would think, honestly, some of these people leave the city from working in CPED and they go out to work for developers. So these people are not from our communities and yet they are the ones having all the power and the control to design our communities. Whew. Yeah, well, we got our work cut out for us, but I'm glad that y'all y'all are gonna get connected. This is gonna keep going from the headwaters uh, of the Mississippi to the mouth of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I want. I think we have maybe like a few minutes for for one or two, couple questions from the audience. Um, 
And uh, I know we have some guests here who traveled from very far to be here. Um, so I wanted to turn it over for y'all first. If you have any questions, no pressure. It's all good if you don't. But uh, well, uh, just a small one. Thank you. It was truly inspiring. And uh, so I'm just going to be able to introduce us. So I'm from India. I'm from the Philippines, from Romet. We are State Department IBM. We are exchange participants. So uh, we've been hearing about all of you uh, from the last three days. Sheila have been telling us all about what's happening here. So my question is that you focus on community-driven, let's say, the projects and how it is very important when community is there. So what have been those strategies or those uh, communication or anything which have worked out for you? Because when somebody, when communities like us want to fight the system, which is happening all around the world, it's very really important that we have the maximum number of people with us. So we've been traveling around the city and we've noticed that a bunch of people are actually sensitized about the things that you have been doing, but uh, a similar kind of proportion of public is not aware about that. So what have been those strategies that have worked out for you and how have you been growing these communities to support you in this uh, fight for, let's say, the planet? Yeah. Thank you. So you want to kick it off? So I just want to uh, let you know just quickly about a strategy I have when I'm dealing with project management and I might come across a grant to manage. I uh, steer funds to support capacity of community-based organizations. I uh, budget money for um, community members to participate. Um, so it's very important for me not to have these grant funds so top heavy. I want to make sure these dollars mounts to get these community members. I want to value their time and, 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 and their, their expertise. So we also pay stipends to community members um, to honor their time with money. Um, whereas it's, we just completed a wall leaders cohort that had seven or eight activities. And if they attended three of them, they received honorarium. So they did not, they were not required to attend all of the activities. So they got some experience throughout the process. Um, we, uh, with the Transform Canals Project, we were awarded a 100 Years Challenge grant. And what we're doing now, as we had the war leaders cohort with individuals, we're going to have that cohort with community-based organizations. Because a lot of times when it's come down to applying for grants, we go call the community and say, hey, I need you to support this, and can you give me a letter of support? But you don't have a true relationship with them. So it's taking that time with those community-based organizations, educate them, build them up, build a true relationship up, and then they, and they are aware of the project, and it's not grant-driven, and then we go into the community for that. So this is building relationships, it's building their capacity to do their work, and I follow this methodology where they're dealing with transforming canals, or whether it's doing collecting climate change data. It's always that type of methodology to make sure the community members are well supported. Okay. Uh, real quick, I just want to say, can my team from CMEJ stand up real quick? Yeah, they're giving up four days to be with me. <laughs> out here and even tired and hungry. They've been walking and biking all day, not me, but they've been walking and biking all day. So I just want to say, you know, like building up people, like he said, um, and also instilling people with the tools that were given to me. So, um, you know, Danielle, was, I was fortunate enough to have Danielle as a friend. We were brought together by losing a friend in common. Um, and, um, she also was a part of Speak, so having that, you know, tool, it was like bringing her in. I also knew uh, Hawa and Justice from a prior job working with Juxtaposition Art, so they were these amazing, brilliant artists um, who asked, you know, could they help? <laughs> and now, I don't know, <laughs> they were like, I don't know if y'all like, oh, we got ourselves into a lot now, but... You know, they, they're doing like cartooning and stuff, so now they use their cartooning skills to make graphics and get people's attention. So they definitely like lighten the mood for people because I'm serious out here. And I think people are like, you know, they get 
it's heavy, it's heavy work. So you gotta have different styles and different ways of like working with people. And, um, and then I have my friend in the back that I've known since I was 12, Rose, who's been, you know, just with me uh, from the beginning as well. Just a lot of people have supported me. So like trying to put that investment back into people, especially people who are willing to do something like tapping into what they're good at. You know, Danielle's a real estate agent. She's also an organizer. Also worked in banking. So I got her doing all that at CMEJ. Uh, Rose is good at everything. And she got like seven kids. So I'm telling you, she know how to mastermind and figure it out. Um, and beyond that, a school teacher, you know, going to college and um, just an amazing person. Um, Justice as well, how as well. Both of them are, were already amazing before they got to see me, Jay, but just ask them to like use those tools for the movement. Um, I did a lot of burning myself out to get to where I am too. <laughs> like, um, just like super volunteer, you know, like I, people needed help, I just would show up. Somebody was hungry, I would do that. Anybody needed a ride, we needed groceries. You need to get down to City Hall. Okay, you scared to say something to the mayor? Because I ain't scared. I'll say it. Okay. You know, like, I think it was just a lot of, like, Roxanne will do it, you know, and so I've had to calm down, but I still am out here a lot. And so I think the best way to gain power is to build relationships. That is the best way because power is relational. Um, and people are super powerful. I think even just showing up to a space quietly and asking for a, a meeting, like having it on the schedule, and then also not letting it get to the point where people ask you to leave. Like, be dangerous, say what you need to say, but leave on your own time, right? Because that also builds your power. Because it's like, well, look, we said what we had to say, and then we left, you know what I mean? But we'll be back. Um, uh, what else was really good? We also give stipends. Um, I need to work on celebrating more. That's a part of organizing. They say you have to really celebrate. You have to um, in this work. And so trying to figure out how to like celebrate these wins. Um, I pray a lot about this work. I tell God I'm quitting every other day. But I think I think the universe kind of, if you allow yourself to be used for a higher purpose, it will use you and it will bring you along. And I've been told to make sure that you ask, you know, the ancestors or, you know, the universe or whatever you believe in for something back, you know? And so I haven't figured out what that ask is, but I think um, for right now, I'm just grateful to be used. All right, Rebecca, how are we doing? You said there's some kind of reception. We're at time, but I want to see if maybe there's like one more question from the audience. What do you all think? Oh, yeah, let's pass the mic to you. Thank you very much. Um, I am a new New Orleanian, um, lived here for two years. And so I invest a lot of time in learning everything I can about the culture here, the politics here. Um, because I don't just live here, I want to be a community member um, actively. Um, so with that, and I was working on operations, so my operations brain was attorney. And as you were talking, um, I've lived all over the world, and I've lived along a lot of Mississippi towns. We've got St. Louis, we've got Chicago. These are powerful cities with powerful um, advocates, smart, smart people, often people of color um, from diverse communities. Um, and so my follow-up question, or my statement question would be, uh, and you guys kind of clued into it, about, hey, can we keep in touch? Just Spirit just said, why not have an organization along the Mississippi River? Because really, when you talk about ecology, when you talk about nature, it's like picking up a piece of lint, taking care of your own neighborhood. We are completely linked. This is this was the original highway of the United yeah, States, yeah, sure. right? And so, and there are hundreds and hundreds of years of abuse of this 
string. I mean, Chicago invented something that turned the flow of the Mississippi away from them into St. Louis. Like, there's, there's other conversations that need to happen in order for your work to matter. Because it will matter in our communities, which means everything to me. But it also, we are so interconnected that taking care of this little itty bitty pinky toe of pollution here really doesn't mean anything as this river flows. And flows into an ocean, by the way, right? Like, we are all intercommunicating, uh, interconnected. And so my thought was, was, why not? I'm glad I added my email address. Um, but why not consider a yearly function where you guys start going, where are you? Where are the people? Because I'm sure there are other people that do what you do along this river. Um, and to create an organization of indigenous people, black people, queer people, all the people, and because there is power in them. Thank you for that. I was just gonna also reply and say, we were hoping to do like an EJ conference once we get this land um, and kind of use that old Northern Metals facility as a place where we can meet. It doesn't, I think we can meet in multiple states, right? Um, but I think it's powerful. Maybe it's time to do some, what we call power mapping. And I know you probably, you, know, you all are familiar with it, but we probably need to do some power mapping of like, you know, Who's in charge around here? Like all along the river. In, in, in New Orleans, one celebration on the river, my alpha celebration, um, talking about the transatlantic slave trade, um, Ashley Culture Arts Center, um, Chief, um, Chief Equity Officer, As Asali Divine Ecclesiastics, um, hates that organization, um, that, that center. And so, um, that is one celebration along the water. We talk about the transatlantic slave trade. And so um, that's a great way we can start connecting it um, on a regular basis. Um, like she said, let's continue to connect. And I think that's actually a really good note to close on. And I would invite maybe Rebecca to, to share some final words, because I know that this is part of a longer Mississippi River project. Um, so maybe Rebecca, you can, you can speak to that and then close us, close us out, at least for this portion of the event. Thank you. Yeah, to speak to the, the river, the whole basin. Um, again, we're part of this Mississippi River Open School for Social Exchange and Kinship. And, um, and there are, of course, many other sort of iterations of river region connecting that can be done. Um, but this, this current open school has iterations and groups of people up and down the river who have been organizing together, creating works of art collaborating on um, knowledge co-production. Some of that takes the form of academic um, articles and scholarship, but also a lot of it takes the form of these um, shared open experiences that are often place-based where there's dialogue and exchange. And what's um, been really humbling and powerful to witness is how that how that communication is layering and growing and building. So I see us in, as part of that web, but of course we each come with our own experiences and relationships, and so that network is is um is growing like the mushrooms and mycelium that a lot of us are learning from yeah. right now. So um it's just been a very uh, honor and moving to listen to each of you tonight. With um thank you for leading us, Michael, and um and to Joe who's like already on to another dialogue, which is so <laughs> powerful. Everyone is like working and being present and showing up. Um, and speaking truth. So uh, please come join us to the reception and we can yeah, carry on the conversations. Um, and thank you all, thank you for making it to campus. Uh, we're always trying to have campus be welcoming and I just, like, in my gut, when I heard Joe be looking for this space, I just, <laughs> it, it means so much that anyone travels here and finds their way um, to this, to this uh, base of a place. And it, um, it means that I'll have to have your voices here on campus. All right, thanks for coming.